And good evening. We begin top story tonight with the severe storms taking aim at the south. Millions bracing for what could be a very dangerous night. The system already leaving behind a trail of destruction. A tornado tearing through this home in St. Joseph, Missouri. The pile of metal twisted was once an elementary school gym and a cafeteria. An EF2 twister completely destroying both structures in Springdale, Arkansas. Thankfully, no injuries reported there. And that storm is gaining power, bringing strong winds and a threat of more tornadoes from the Gulf Coast all the way up through the Ohio Valley. Al Roker is standing by tonight with a forecast. But first, Blaine Alexander leads us off from inside the storm zone. Tonight, in city after city, people are racing for shelter as a major storm rips its way across the south, toppling trees and damaging homes in its path. Damage has only increased as winds blow through state after state in parts of the Midwest and South overnight, including Arkansas, which faced hurricane force winds and at least one confirmed tornado. Storms injuring at least seven people near Springdale, two critically, and leaving thousands without power. I don't know how I'm still walking because, I mean, it went straight, straight above me. And I think we're all just counting our blessings. And just outside of Dallas, more damage. That little noise all of a sudden was big, huge banging noises. And I sat straight up in bed and said, oh my God, we're hit by a tornado. As the storm continues its brutal charge to the east, millions remain in its path, with parts of Louisiana, Alabama, Georgia, and Florida bracing for a direct hit tonight. All right, and Blaine Alexander joins us now from Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, the worst of that storm has moved past where you are, from what I understand. Where is it headed next, Blaine, and what can we expect? Yeah. Well, Tom, we're still feeling some of the remnants here. We're still getting some rain, still some wind. But as this storm continues to move to the east, if what we've seen so far is any indication, the biggest concern is going to be winds. Of course, this brought with it a number of tornado warnings, but there is also concern over those straight line winds. There have been reports of damage here in the Jackson area as well, so that will likely be surveyed in the hours to come. But remember, this is going to keep moving across the southeast. New Orleans still hasn't felt the brunt of it. It's going to move across Alabama, Georgia, and continue through the night, Tom. Blaine Alexander leading us off from the storm zone tonight here on Top Story. Blaine, thank you. Tens of millions across the country now bracing for more dangerous weather. The highest risk is in the deep south tonight. I want to bring in Al Roker for more. Now, we've been tracking these storms for a couple days now. Yeah, and they are unfortunately living up to their promise. Uh, we are looking at tornado watches now stretching from the Ohio River Valley all the way down to the Gulf into New Orleans. They're under tornado watches as well. And here's the risk area. 29 million people through the Tennessee and Mississippi River Valleys from Louisville, Knoxville, Atlanta, down to New Orleans, Pensacola. The storm impacts 80 mile per hour wind gusts possible in this area. The damage from these winds could extend hundreds of miles and extensive power outages as well. And strong tornadoes likely. These nocturnal tornadoes, as we've told you, twice as deadly as the daytime ones. These could be EF2 or stronger. And the same areas that got hit a week ago, well, they're going to get hit again tonight on into tomorrow as this system pushes through. So uh, for tonight into tomorrow, the system makes its way toward the east. Uh, the threat will extend from the Ohio River Valley all the way down to the Gulf Coast. Tomorrow, 33 million people at risk from just west of New York City all the way down to the panhandle of Florida as this system makes its way east, comes along the coast, finally pushes off the coast sometime late tomorrow night on into Friday. Behind it, much colder air. Rainfall amounts, we're talking the heaviest, Tom, down to the south in the Gulf, upwards of three inches of rain. So besides the tornadoes, besides the wind, they may have to worry about flash flooding as well. And Al, I know you and your team are also tracking some wildfires, but the interesting thing here is not necessarily where you would think. No, absolutely. In fact, there, there are four areas right now, down through Florida, up through the Tennessee and Ohio River Valleys, where we're seeing wildfires breaking out right now in Tennessee, through Texas, into the southwest, and on into the panhandle of Oklahoma. Strong winds, low relative humidities. Luckily, this will probably uh, start to digress or start to downgrade as this system moves through. But in the meantime, because of these winds and this low humidity, wildfires are a real possibility in places that don't normally get them. Now to the latest on the war in Ukraine. Russia signaling pullback, but continuing brutal attacks overnight. Kiev hit with another round of intense shelling and at least a dozen killed in strikes near the Black Sea. And tonight, news that those closest to Putin are lying to him about the state of this war. Richard Engel is on the ground again for us tonight. 
Leaving the city of Kharkiv today, it doesn't take long to reach the front line. Russian troops destroyed these cars while trying to invade the city. But in the fields overlooking the highway, we followed Ukrainian troops to see what U.S. officials tell NBC News Russian generals are afraid to show their president, that the Russian military is losing ground and suffering too many losses to hide. This was a Russian camp, and you could see they had all of their weapons here, dugout positions, and they were bombed. There's still some bodies in this area, and they left a lot of their equipment behind after what appears to have been a devastating attack on their position. There's nothing left. It seems the Russians here never knew what hit them. Their uniforms lay strewn on the ground. Ukrainian troops helped themselves to abandon weapons. Andre, a sniper who didn't want to show his face, said 120 Russian soldiers were at this position and that Ukrainians took dozens captive. Others still lay where they fell. We counted 12 bodies. Russia never expected its invasion to be stopped in its tracks. Knocking out this position also allowed Ukrainian troops to recapture today the nearby village of Malorohan from Russian soldiers. The Babkov family was enjoying their new freedom. The bombings were horrible. The airstrikes were the worst, says Nadia. They showed me where they've been hiding all this time without power. Right, I have a flashlight on my phone. Let's see if we can. They stayed down in this cold, cramped cellar for the last 27 days. Do you think the worst is over? I hope our soldiers tame this beast. The Russian president is deranged, says Leonid. I wish his kids would have to go through this. Maybe then it would be different. His granddaughter Elisa spent her time drawing on the walls, images of happier days. It was my therapy to keep calm, she says. Wise words from a girl who just turned eight. Today, Elisa was drawing with her chalk outside. Down the road, 88-year-old Praskovia was sitting by herself, disoriented and frightened. I'm so afraid, my whole body is shaking. At night, I cover myself in a blanket and I shake, she says. Mostly, she wanted comfort. Praskovia says she lived through World War II and doesn't have the strength to go through it all again. Tom, Ukrainian troops right now, and I think the Ukrainian people in general, believe that they have a lot of momentum at this moment and they want to push it. They don't have confidence in what Russia says. They don't trust that Russia is going to scale back any attacks. They want to liberate this entire country, all of it. That's the only thing they're focused on right now, the troops. They're, they're not really watching these negotiations. They're watching the incoming and outgoing fire. Tonight, bipartisan outrage over new statements from former President Donald Trump. Trump publicly calling on Putin to release potentially harmful information about President Biden and his son. The incident drawn comparisons to the infamous 2019 phone call that led to Mr. Trump's first impeachment. Garrett Haig has the latest. As long as Putin has Tonight, former President Trump facing bipartisan backlash to these new comments asking President Putin for dirt on the Bidens. Why did the mayor of Moscow's wife give the Bidens, both of them, three and a half million dollars? So now I would think Putin would know the answer to that. I think he should release it. Mr. Trump referencing findings from a 2020 report by Senate Republicans into Hunter Biden's business dealings in Ukraine. Lawyers for President Biden's son say there was no payment. Mr. Well, Trump's new request in echoes in similar in asks in 2016 about Hillary Clinton. Russia, if you're listening, I hope you're able to find the 30,000 emails that are missing. And the 2019 phone call with Ukraine's President Zelensky also asking for damaging information on the Bidens that resulted in his first impeachment. At least he's consistent, consistently immoral and unpatriotic uh, to be appealing to Putin at a time when Russia is killing Ukrainians uh, once again for dirt on his opponents. Some Republicans condemning the request. I don't think we should be asking Putin to do anything. He's one of the worst people on the planet and uh, America shouldn't be asking uh, for favors. Hunter Biden knew exactly. While others point to an ongoing federal criminal investigation into possible tax fraud and money laundering by Hunter Biden, who has denied any wrongdoing.
he could talk about what he wants to talk about. I am interested to hear what happens with uh, Hunter Biden, though, and the federal investigation into him. And uh, I imagine that we'll be learning more about that. Garrett joins us now from Capitol Hill. Garrett, what is the White House saying? A lot of allegations going back between both parties. The White House's exasperated response to this today sounded a lot like Adam Schiff's, the communications director, saying from the podium, what kind of America would want to advertise their work with Vladimir Putin on any issue, let alone on something like this? She said she could think of only one, Donald Trump. Tom? All right, Garrett Haig for us tonight. Garrett, thank you for that. We want to head back overseas now. Thousands of mourners taking to the streets in Israel tonight after an armed assailant killed five people, firing from a motorcycle. The shooting, the latest in a string of attacks, authorities say have been carried out by Arab assailants as the country's security forces remain on high alert. Kathy Park has the latest. Tonight's stunning new video appearing to show Israeli police chasing and killing a gunman in a shootout who moments ago had just opened fire on innocent civilians. One of the officers caught in the gun battle among the dead. At least five killed in B'nai Brock after the assailant went on a shooting spree firing from a motorcycle. <laughs> Cell phone video shows the gunman, who according to Israeli media was Palestinian and from the West Bank, dressed in black and armed with an assault rifle in the ultra-Orthodox neighborhood outside of Tel Aviv before he stops a moving vehicle and shoots the driver. You could have gone on with this uh, massacre on and on, but police uh, who uh, found him, shot him, killed him, and stopped this massacre. The country now on edge. Israeli security forces raiding homes in the West Bank today, arresting at least 30 Palestinians. According to Israeli authorities, this latest shooting, now the third attack by Arab assailants in Israel in the past week. The death toll now stands at 11. On Sunday, a pair of gunmen killing two young police officers during a shooting in the central city of Hedera. And last week, a lone assailant killing four people in a car ramming and stabbing attack in the southern city of Beersheba. Those attacks stoking fears of wider escalation as a holy Muslim month of Ramadan and the anniversary of last year's Gaza war approaches. <laughs> Israel's prime minister rallying the country's rattled citizens and escalating defenses, calling a security cabinet meeting and increasing police presence in Israeli cities. Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas also condemning the killing of Israeli civilians, saying further violence on either side would only lead to the deterioration of an already tense situation between the Palestinians and Israelis. <laughs> Mourners now gathering for the burial of those killed in yesterday's shooting, packing the streets and praying over the bodies of the deceased. <laughs> All right, back here at home into the pandemic, President Biden getting his second booster shot today as he called on Congress to pass billions of dollars in additional COVID-19 funding. The president receiving his fourth Pfizer shot on camera just one day after the FDA approved the extra dose for Americans 50 and older. The White House also rolling out COVID.gov, a website to help Americans access COVID-19 tests and vaccines, along with location-specific infection rates. All right, still ahead tonight, the breakthrough in a murder case after more than 40 years, a young woman kidnapped and killed on Long Island in the 80s. Her murder going unsolved for decades. The new technology that helped police track her down, track down her killer. Plus the shocking robbery caught on camera, the suspect using a cinder block to break into a taxi cab. And an NBC News exclusive will take you behind the scenes of Space Force, how the newest branch of the military is preparing for a doomsday attack. Top story, just getting started. Back now with a chilling story out of Long Island, where tonight police say they've identified the killer responsible for the death of a young woman in 1980. The case ran cold, but a familial DNA match brought answers to a sister that never gave up. NBC's Zinclay Essamwa has that story. Tonight, an unsolved cold case. A 20-year-old woman kidnapped, raped, and killed in 1980 in New York. Now closed. Police identifying Eve Wilkowitz's killer about 42 years to the date of her murder. 
I still can't believe that I heard those words. We've identified the person responsible for the death of Eve. Wilkowitz never made it back from work on March 22nd, 1980. Police say she was strangled by a long unidentified man. Her body found three days later near her apartment on Long Island. Eve's only sister, Irene Wilkowitz, urging investigators to continue searching decades later. She was a real person. She never got a chance to fulfill her, her dreams. Initially, police ran a rape kit analysis, but found nothing. Due to the technology at the time, no, uh, no donor profile, no DNA profile was able to be obtained. But times have changed. New genetic genealogy allowing police to put DNA samples into consumer databases instead of just criminal sites for a much wider pool. Are criminal databases effective? and comprehensive. Law enforcement databases work very well if someone has committed a violent crime and their DNA is in the system. When they don't work well is when someone has stayed under the radar. CC Moore is a prominent genetic genealogist. My team alone has helped solve over 200 law enforcement cases. In 2018, the serial rapist and murderer, the Golden State Killer, was found using genetic genealogy testing. We are able to perform investigative genetic genealogy in all 50 states. There are some that are concerned that there could be overreach by law enforcement using this very powerful tool. Moore says not all genomics company data from places like 23andMe and Ancestry is available to law enforcement, and states have different restrictions. In New York, where Eve was murdered, a special permit is required to do this type of testing. So the lieutenant overseeing the investigation, Kevin Bayer, asked the FBI to use the technique. Officials say it led them to a family member of the perpetrator who agreed to DNA testing and ultimately led to the man they believe to be the murderer, Herbert Rice. Police say Rice had a number of arrests for nonviolent offenses. He died of cancer in 1991. Authorities exhuming his body mid-March to run the DNA testing. As for the family of Eve, her parents died before the discovery. And Irene now knows who killed her sister, but is left wrestling with why. I've lived these past 42 years afraid all the time that I was going to be killed next. But somehow I'm still here. And maybe it's just to help other people in, in similar situations. Such a sad story. Zinclay Esamoah joins us now here, from here, right here in 30 Rock. Zinclay, obviously this is a, a huge for Eve's family, but I imagine the murderer's family is shocked as well. I mean, they came forward and they submitted that DNA. That's right, Tom. So largely the family of the man police believe to be the murderer, Herbert Rice, has declined to comment, though our colleague reporter John Shoopy highlighted in his reporting that the murderer's son is considering speaking with Irene, Eve's sister, but hasn't yet decided. And Tom, Eve's sister actually thanked that family for giving their DNA to this investigation, even saying that she was sorry that they, too, have to learn that their family member did this. So really an emotional day for everybody, Tom. Yeah, incredibly complicated if those families do eventually get together. I do want to ask you, though, th this is a, a thing with law enforcement that they're asking for people to contribute their own DNA so they can sort of store it and have it for crimes like this? Yeah, it's really interesting, Tom. So CC Moore, the expert I spoke with, says that actually most companies that collect DNA samples have restrictions toward law enforcement. So that's companies like 23andMe. But she cited that GedMatch and Family Tree, those are two companies, do allow law enforcement to use that data. And she says if people are interested in supporting these kind of efforts to solve cold cases and crimes, they should keep those distinctions in mind, Tom. All right, Zinclay, thank you for that story. Next up, an NBC News exclusive tonight, the first behind-the-scenes look at America's Space Force, now on guard against a potential Russian or even Chinese attack. And with Vladimir Putin's nuclear threats, the stakes could not be higher. Here's NBC's Tom Costello. Behind this razor-wired fence in Colorado, a highly classified Space Force asset. Under heavy armed guard, this 18-wheeler packed with high-value satellite comms is one of several mobile command centers poised to roll out in the event of a doomsday attack that would target U.S. military satellite control. If you need to, how fast can you move these trucks out? The specific timelines are classified, but what I can say is a matter of hours. Thank you. Sign up. At the main Space Force Satellite Ops Center, our cameras were the first ever led inside. Line down. 
It's here that they keep watch over America's military satellites and the world's GPS network, operating in an increasingly hostile environment. It is truly a warfighting domain. Um, our adversaries are fielding specific weapon systems in the domain, um, so we need to view it as such. The Pentagon says Russia and China are the chief adversaries. In November, a Russian satellite targeted and blew up another Russian satellite, creating a massive orbiting debris field. China conducted a similar test in 2007. U.S. commanders believe China has deployed a satellite with a robotic arm to reach out and grab other satellites. And Russia has nesting satellites loaded with offensive weapons. And liftoff. The head of Space Force says U.S. commercial and military satellites are routinely harassed. Whether it's um, uh, jamming or, or, or harmful interference in the RF spectrum, laser dazzling, cyber attacks, you know, cyber probing and cyber attacks. Those attacks monitored 24-7 in this classified command center. More than 70% of military satellite communications come through here. Everything from nuclear command and control orders to presidential communications, down to a Coast Guard cutter, a submarine, even tactical units on the ground. And if they don't have the communications when they need it, things can go seriously wrong. As the Navy has sailors, the new Space Force has guardians, many with engineering degrees and now training for the new battlefield. The concern, the Pentagon says China is now outpacing the U.S. in launches and modernizing its own space capabilities, building a remote robotic post on the far side of the moon, invisible to U.S. satellites. If we don't start accelerating our development and delivery capabilities, they will exceed it. Commanders here worry Beijing and Moscow could one day deploy offensive military weapons in the space between the moon and Earth, an area called cislunar. We don't want there to be a war in space. We want all of humanity to continue to use all the benefits of space for all of our good. But, but if others choose to uh, start a war there, we'll be ready. And you believe the threat is growing exponentially and by the day? Absolutely, and that, that goes without question. Uh, we've seen the public testing of China and Russia. All right, Tom joins us now on set. So, Tom, I want to start where you finished there. You know, this is a different type of space race, and it sounds like the Chinese are almost gaining on us. Well, the concern from the Pentagon and the commanding generals uh, is that, yes, they have about eight years until they catch up with us. At the pace at which they're moving right now, they believe the Chinese will outpace the United States in terms of their presence in orbit. Not only satellites, but also their space station, whatever do they're doing on the far side of the moon, 2030. You know, I think a lot of viewers are going to be watching your story and their minds are going to be blown because when President Trump first announced this, the Space Force, he was widely mocked. Yeah. And yet you saw this up close and you were just telling me this is no joke. Well, I got to tell you, when I w showed up in Colorado Springs, they offered us th this opportunity. And, you know, the Steve Carell comedy on, on Netflix is playing in my mind. And I asked a lot of them, you know, is it hard to live that down? But I I got to tell you, the caliber of the officers here, you're talking about majors and colonels and generals with master's degrees and PhDs in astrophysics. I mean, these are real brainiacs. And the culture is different. This is an apple culture, not an army culture. They are collaborative. They're trying to pick the best brains, whether that's a, a high school enlisted personnel or an officer with a PhD to solve these high tech problems. And they believe the threat is very real. All right, Tom, thank you for that. And Tom will have another inside look at Space Force tomorrow. Talking about recruitment and who is signing up. When we come back, an update on that missing Nevada woman last seen in a Walmart parking lot. The suspect now charged in her disappearance, appearing in court today. The FBI now offering a $10,000 reward for any information about her whereabouts. Stay with us. All right, now to Top Stories news feed, and we begin with the latest in the search for a missing woman from Nevada. 41-year-old Troy Driver appearing before a judge for the first time on charges connected to the disappearance of 18-year-old Naomi Arion. He is being held on a $750,000 bail, and police say he previously served prison time in connection to the murder of a woman in 1997. Naomi was last seen on March 12th in a Walmart parking lot. The FBI is now offering a $10,000 reward for information leading to her arrest. The search tonight for a suspect in a shocking robbery caught on camera in New York. Security cam footage capturing this woman smashing the window of a taxi cab with a cinder block. The suspect then reaching into the car, making off with an iPhone and $40 in cash. 
Now to the massive fire at a Pennsylvania bowling alley. Aerial footage showing flames ripping through the building early this morning. The inferno causing the building's roof to collapse. Officials say the fire started at a nearby shed before moving to the bowling alley, which residents say has been a community landmark for generations. So far, no injuries have been reported. And country music star Eric Church facing some backlash after he canceled his sold-out San Antonio concert for March Madness. The North Carolina native and lifelong Tar Heels fan announcing he canceled Saturday's show so he can watch Carolina and Duke in their final four. It's the first time the two rivals have faced off in the, this leg of the tournament. Refunds will be issued for Saturday's concert. Now we want to take you back to Ukraine where the refugee crisis is getting worse by the day. The number of refugees fleeing Ukraine now tops 4 million. And while the majority of them are women and children, another vulnerable population is also being ravaged by this war, the elderly. NBC's Gabe Gutierrez talked to the volunteers trying to get them out. For refugees of all ages, the journey is grueling. But for older Ukrainians, it can be nearly impossible. I guess uh, the government don't have, uh, doesn't have time for the think about old people. Daniel Koretnik grew up south of Kyiv, but had been living in Portugal before the war. Now he's back to coordinate rescue efforts for older refugees. His network of volunteers fanning out across hard-hit areas. We try to, to take people from dangerous places. There's a web of organizations racing to evacuate the elderly. According to Help Age International, Ukraine has the largest percentage of older people affected by conflict in the world. One in four people here is over 60 years old. Most of them don't want to be evacuated from their homes, yet 91% need help to get food because of mobility issues. Julia Enton, a paralegal in Los Angeles, is among those trying to get them out. This is their home. And now at the later stages of their life, they have, been, they have to be torn away from everything that they knew. It can almost be too much to bear. We met Valentina after her agonizing escape from Mariupol. The grandmother sobbed as she described her 15-mile trek on foot to a humanitarian bus. We were bombarded ruthlessly, she says. One word can describe the situation, hell. But she calls her 8-year-old granddaughter a hero for helping her. An awful journey that she says would have been impossible to survive alone. And breaking late today, news that would make it easier for immigrants, including those fleeing Ukraine, to come to the U.S. The Biden administration in late May now plans to lift Title 42, the public health policy that denied asylum seekers entry due to COVID. Officials at the border are anticipating a surge when the policy lifts. Tom. All right, Gabe, thank you for that. Now to Global Watch. Eight U.N. peacekeepers were killed after a helicopter crash in the Democratic Republic of Congo. The helicopter came down in an area controlled by M23 rebels. Congo's army claims the rebels shot down the aircraft, but the U.N. says the cause is still under investigation. The victors, victims are from Pakistan, Serbia, and Romania. In Haiti, violent protests breaking out over rising crime in the country. New video shows dozens of demonstrators taking over a plane belonging to a U.S. missionary group. The group then setting the plane on fire while it was on the tarmac in Le Caille. No one inside the plane was hurt outside the airport. At least one person killed in clashes between protesters and police. And in the Philippines, evacuations underway after multiple volcanic eruptions. The volcano about 40 miles outside the capital city of Manila, shooting ash and steam a mile into the air. Several earthquakes also reported. Authorities now asking thousands living in nearby villages to leave their home over safety concerns. All right, we turn now to the Americas where we focus on stories from the U.S. and across Latin America. Tonight, more than 2,000 people under arrest in El Salvador after one of the bloodiest weekends in 30 years. The government declaring a state of emergency, as we've told you about, insisting they're fighting a war on gangs. But human rights groups are concerned the recent crackdown is giving way to human rights violations. NBC's Isa Gutierrez has more. Tonight, the crackdown on gangs intensifies in El Salvador. Ese sufrimiento que le hagan a la población... Lo van a sufrir ellos aquí. As these images of mass arrests <laughs> and police searching through homes and families' belongings at neighborhood checkpoints fuel concerns that human rights are being violated. 
President Nayib Bukele and the National Police touting the efforts on social media all week using the hashtag War Against Gangs. On Wednesday, citing over 2,000 arrests made in just four days in response to one of the bloodiest weekends in the country in 30 years. The National Civil Police reporting 62 homicides on Saturday alone. <laughs> The president sharing these videos appearing to show prison guards roughly forcing inmates to move with clubs, tweeting also that those arrested would not be freed and announcing meals for incarcerated gang members would be cut to one a day. This as police round up others on the street after a state of emergency was imposed on Sunday that suspends constitutional rights like freedom of assembly and the right to an attorney when detained. The strategy in El Salvador seems to be first they arrest, then they tweet about it, and then eventually in the future they might investigate these people. This is exactly the opposite of what has to be done under a rule of law and under basic principles in a democracy. Many Salvadorans supporting the government's move. Lo que el presidente está haciendo está correcto. Todas las pandillas hay que darle duro también, así como ellos hacen con la población. But Juan Papier, the America's senior researcher at Human Rights Watch, is concerned the arrests could extend beyond those involved in the recent violence. We know of people who are not allowed to leave their neighborhoods because of checkpoints that the army has established. And we're also seeing in social media that the police in El Salvador is simply saying that they will arrest people based on their appearance. In December, the U.S. Treasury Department said Bukele's administration provided financial incentives to Salvadoran gangs to, quote, ensure that incidents of gang violence and the number of confirmed homicides remained low. In a message to the international community this week, President Bukele tweeting that no countries have helped El Salvador in the war against gangs, adding, quote, do not come later and try to tell us what we should have done or not do. I think Bukele is um, using this moment to gather more popularity. He knows that a key factor for his very high popularity rates in El Salvador is the decrease in violence, and it's also his talent for communications. Is it working? We don't know if it's working. We know that the um, violence in the country has decreased uh, in the last two days, but it's impossible to tell whether this is the result of the um, policies by the Bukele administration. Earlier this week, Bukele said more than 70,000 gang members were still on the streets. He now says he's asking the president of Congress to convene lawmakers to give him more legal tools to take on gangs. All right, Issa joins us now, so that's the big question. Will the Congress there in El Salvador grant him more powers? Well, President Bukele is highly likely to get the votes that he needs to continue to make these arrests. Now, what Papier from Human Rights Watch told me is surprising to him and even of concern to him is the speed at which the president has managed to take control of the National Assembly that grants him these rights, right? I mean, he came into office just in 2019. Another thing, Tom, that I want to mention that experts talk about uh, when they speak of the continuation of this crackdown is, again, that support, the, the backing that Bukele has from the Salvadoran people. This whole week, we have seen his supporters praise these efforts, right? And really, throughout his presidency, uh, they have supported him and, and really praised uh, the efforts that they say that he has been a part of to curb violence in their country, something that they have been concerned about for years. Now, on Tuesday, I do want to mention that the government um, announced that there were no homicides reported in El Salvador. That, Tom, is exactly what Bukele's supporters want to hear right now. Yeah, we, we understand that, but we also heard in your story there that the, the murder rate went down over two days. Do they know if it's tied to, to this policy? I mean, there's been, I think, 600 arrests or something like that. Do we, do we know if they're connected? There have been thousands of arrests at this point. Okay. The number that we got today is actually over 2,000, according over 2, to 000. President okay. Bukele. Unbelievable in just a matter of a few days. Tom, right now, experts are saying it is too early to tell whether that apparent drop in violence is due to this crackdown. Uh, Papier also said that it could be due to the fact that gangs are seeing what's happening on the streets and they're deciding to stop activity because of that, or it could be completely unrelated. We just don't know right now. It is too early to know at this time. Yeah, we're going to have to see what the law long-term rates show. Okay, Isa, thank you for that. Still ahead tonight, the changes that could be coming to your 401k. Congress considering a bill that would raise contribution limits and create incentives for younger workers. What you need to know to maximize your retirement payout. Stay with us.
All right, we want to turn now to money talks, what consumers and investors need to know from the business world and beyond. A bill aimed at helping Americans save more for retirement is heading to the Senate after overwhelming approval in the House. The bill looks to raise contribution limits and incentivize more workers to participate in retirement savings plans. CNBC senior personal finance correspondent Sharon Epperson joins us now. Sharon, we're talking about 401ks here. Who gets to save more and how much exactly? Well, the great thing is that you can be automatically enrolled in a 401k plan with them taking out 3% of your salary going into that savings program. And so that's a great thing for so many employees. But another thing that some people are looking at is when you actually take the money out. Some people are working later in life and they don't want to be forced to take money out at the age of 72, which is the way it is currently. This new legislation would require those mandatory withdrawals at the age of 73 starting next year. And so that is something that many people are really appreciating. Also, you can do a catch-up contribution if you're 50 or older of $6,500 a year right now. That would increase to $10,000 a year for that catch-up contribution if you're 62, 63, or 64. Yeah, these are some major changes. We're going to have to see if the Senate votes on this bill, but it could bring about a lot of good things for people who are looking to try to get that money out a little later. This bill also includes some benefits for younger workers, like incentives for participants in retirement plans. Absolutely. So, again, the factor that, that you can automatically put, be put into a retirement plan and then you have the option of opting out is good because you don't have to figure out, should I do it? You're going to start, when you start the job, you'll start in that 401k plan. That's great. Employers are now also going to be able to offer some incentives if this bill goes through. And those incentives could be cash if you sign up, or it could be a gift card. So that's something that's a perk that some may be looking toward. But the biggest perk, I think, for a lot of people who are dealing with student loan debt is that this will allow the employer to match the contribution that you put in the payment that you make to pay down your student loan. So you can do both at the same time. A lot of folks wondering, do I pay off my debt? Do I save for retirement? This would allow you to do both by matching, giving you a matching contribution of the amount of money that you're putting into your for into your uh, payment, I should say, that you're making to your student loan. So the ability to pay down your student loan debt and save for retirement is something that a lot of workers, young and old, who have student loan debt are looking for. Yeah, incredibly important. CNBC Sharon Epperson for us tonight. Sharon, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. When we come back, the special reunion between Holocaust survivors, the two men unknowingly attending a dinner together here in the States nearly 80 years after the war ended, the moment they recognized each other. Stay with us. Finally tonight, a story of survival and the reunion nearly eight decades in the making. Two Holocaust survivors living in South Florida, realizing they live only 40 miles apart. Ari Odzer of our South Florida station, WTVJ, has her story. That's how I look. Jack Waxall then and now. He's 97, lives in Bal Harbor, and he has seen more than you can imagine. But Sam Ron can more than imagine it. He lived it too, alongside Jack in the Pianchi forced labor camp. It is a miracle how we survived. It's no question about it. That's correct. That's the biggest miracle because it does not happen every day, you know. Jack escaped the camp and survived six months in the forest in winter. American liberators saved Sam from a Nazi death march. The two men lost touch for 79 years until last Sunday night when Jack recognized Sam at a benefit dinner for the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. Hey, I like I find my brother <laughs> over some 70 years. He jumped on the seat and came running over to my seat and said, you're my brother. He said, I, was, I was very, very, very emotional. I'm normally not a very emotional guy. They spent countless backbreaking hours unloading coal from train cars side by side for over a year. I'm so glad that I got somebody, but he was in my camp in working with me together every day. It was so hard. The two men got revenge on Hitler by living long, successful lives filled with children and grandchildren. This is a great country. I made a lot of money here. They both ended up in Ohio and now South Florida, like they were destined to meet again. They're eager to keep the survivors' flame alive by telling their stories 
Sam has a message tailored to young people. They're trying to teach them not to, not to hate and to hate with other hope and believe in yourself. This is what I did. This is how I survived because I believed in myself. We thank Ari and the powerhouse station of WTVJ for that story. And we thank you for watching us tonight. I'm Tom Yamas in New York. I'll see you right back here tomorrow. Stay right there. More news on the way. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.